Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for effective interprofessional communication with patients and families for safe, quality health literate care. Uh, today, uh, Jill Krupa and Farah Schwartz, that's me, will be presenting today. Tracy Palenko isn't here, but she was a contributor to the presentation. And so um, she's on vacation and, and we said it was okay for her to go. So we come to you today from the University Health Network in Toronto. It's a multi-hospital system, uh, as well as the Center for Interprofessional Education and Care. So welcome to the session. Our goal today is to give you a quick overview of why it's so important to consider interprofessional collaboration in your health literacy work. And so the specific goals of this session are to describe the intersection between interprofessional collaboration and health literacy. So many of you know already about health literacy, but how do these two areas relate and why should interprofessional collaboration be part of your focus? And then the second goal is to help you apply a tool to help plan interprofessional health literacy strategies in your work. So this is a session that's been adapted from an in-person breakout, so it's shorter than it normally would be, but we hope to bring you the most practical elements to use in your work and to make it as engaging as possible. So welcome. As we get started, we wanted to acknowledge the importance of the land from which Jill and I are speaking to you. So we'll start with this land recognition. We acknowledge this sacred land on which the University Health Network operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. This territory was subject of the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are very grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn on this territory. For anyone not familiar with this practice, land acknowledgement is one way of recognizing the long history of the lands on which we're on to reconcile the history and begin to repair the history of colonization and ongoing racism towards Indigenous people that still happens today in Canada. Unfortunately, many groups or individuals do continue to face racism and discrimination in Canada, including people who identify as Black, racialized, gender nonconforming, and many others. So we have a great reputation in Canada, which we're very proud of, but the truth is that we still have a long way to go before we reach inclusivity or comprehensive healthcare for all. We've seen the impact of COVID on groups that already face disparities. So here in Ontario, the impact faced by long-term care residents, those impacted by poverty and systemic discrimination has been especially pronounced as in many other places. So although today the focus of our session isn't the impact of these factors, we would be remiss to speak here without acknowledging the impact of racism, colonization and care gaps uh, on healthcare in general, as well as COVID. So, with that, we'll get started and switch over now to talk a little bit about interprofessional collaboration. So to get started, take a look at these three abbreviations and just take a moment to jot down what you think each one means, or even just take a moment to think about it in, in your mind. So as you think about that, um, we're going to actually ask you to vote on what you think each one means. So. Uh, to get started, if you can have a vote, take a look and just really quickly answer which one you wrote. Um, and we'll just give everybody a quick minute to, uh, to see that. And um, the one thing is, I'll, I'll be honest with you, this is the first time I'm using polling in Zoom, so I'm not sure whether or not everyone can see the answers or the poll as it comes on. Um, Jill, you see it? Okay, sorry everybody, it's, it's you know, the technical things, you can run through so many things. So, okay, so what we see right now is that most of you do think it's emergency department. We got some education, some people who think maybe erectile dysfunction. Really, you can see that all across as you're seeing these, that while there is a stronger emergency department preference, there really are answers across the board. Okay, so I'm gonna end this poll and, um, and now share the results. So, sorry, hopefully, I. I will get better at this through the polls. Um, so as you see, really people did answer across the board. So let's do our next one. Uh, and as I call it up, um, I apologize everybody that this is just taking a quick moment. I'm gonna end that poll and now I see how to work it. There we go. And I, so the next one, do you see, what do you think that that means? And you can have a vote now, please just uh, enter your answers. And by the third one, I, I promise you it'll be seamless. 
So I'm going to count to three and then I'm going to end the polling so everybody can see the results. One, two, three. And it may not surprise you to see that again, we have results that are shared across the board. People thought that DC meant a whole bunch of different things. So the last one, we'll take a look and almost there. Let's see what you thought for CP. So just get your results in fast and furious. Let's see. Quite a few people are thinking cerebral palsy as we watch, as we see. Um, contact person, something else. So quite a few different ones. A lot of things coming through. Some words are healthcare, some words aren't. Um, any Canadians in the group, the Canadian press, it's just a small number of you. And I'm going to end the polling. So get any last words in. And now I'm going to share the results. So again, a lot of people did think that this was cerebral palsy, but really there were answers across the board. Um, and so as you look at this, you probably noticed, or hopefully you noticed a few things. So each one of these answers or many of these answers were legit interpretations of abbreviations that you might hear in healthcare. And then some weren't. So depending on who the person is, they may actually be thinking of something else. I might see CP and all of a sudden my head is in news and Canadian press or, you know, something familiar to people. Um, for those in the health literacy world, we know all about abbreviations and challenges that they cause to safety and engagement and care. But did you know that they can also cause confusion, uncertainty, and even safety issues among healthcare professionals who may actually be using the same abbreviation to refer to something else? So when we think about this, what do you think would happen if we had a meeting to talk about the ED patient and the team included a nurse practitioner, a neurologist, a speech language pathologist, and a dietitian? There's a pretty good chance that we might be talking about very different things there if we never actually stopped to define what ED meant. What about a pharmacist and doctor each having a separate conversation with the patient about planning for DC on the day before the patient goes home. Maybe that has to do with activities after leaving the hospital, or maybe it has to do with discontinuing a medication that needs to be tapered. When we use the acronyms and abbreviations, it really can cause all sorts of problems for patients as well as among team members. There are 79 different medical phrases for CP. So you saw some of them here, including chest pain, candle power, cardiac pacing, chicken pox, child psychiatry, creatinine phosphate, current practice, and don't worry, I won't list all 79, but the list goes on. DC could be discharged, discontinued, doctor of chiropractic, and many others. And there have been many studies documenting abbreviations being challenging for patients to understand as well as among teams. In one study, there was an instruction of take a ta one tablet a day and during one eight hour period in a health system, there were 53 different ways that that was written out for patients. And it's not surprising that patients also interpreted it differently. So patients think we have a common language and often don't realize that we may ourselves have our wires crossed or not be using the same terms or abbreviations to mean different things. Abbreviations can be a huge cause for medical error Error, and from an interprofessional perspective, they can really be confusing and cause misunderstanding and safety issues. So that's just one example of the ways that some of the health literacy challenges we face or the things that we see can also be challenges when we have team members made up of different professions, people, and roles. So this, this comic you see in front of you, Healthcare Deja Vu, is a quick look at the patient experience when it's siloed by provider. And really, this is a best look at, at what could happen. This is inconvenient and inconsistent for the person, repetitive and frustrating. This person is going from provider to provider and answering the same question, and who can blame her for her frustration at the end? The other thing we have to consider as we look at this is what might be falling through the cracks in her care if these team members aren't working together and the person is really the, the person bringing the information between them, could there be anything missed or reported back differently than if they all collaborated together? So this is, and this is frustrating for the patient, but now we're going to hear from uh, an individual named Carmen who had a worse experience because of a lack of interprofessional collaboration. Um, and so we'll hear her story now. Yes, a few years ago, I went through a very painful um, uh, no sound. experience in my life. Um, okay. We did troubleshoot this before, but of course it's a, not working now, so I'll try again. Oh, it's good. Yeah. Yep. I had severe back pain and went through a very painful um, uh, experience in my life. Um, I had severe back pain and neck pain, so I went to see my my primary care doctor, which um, did an A X ray and uh, just told me to exercise and make make sure that I 
stretched. Um, but the pain was so severe that I, I just couldn't exercise. Um, so I decided to move on to a chiropractor and uh, the chiropractor would work on my back and neck and the pain would go away as soon as I left, uh, of course, her office, but then it would come back in no time. So from the chiropractor, I moved on to a neurologist who gave me a prescription and sent me to a physical therapist. And I would be seen by the physical therapist and the chiropractor at the same time, but there was no communication between these two professionals and at the end I was left with the pain and being twisted back and forth which did not help my pain at all. I believe it is important for professionals to work together to bring the best uh, treatment for patients and if, I, if my, the professionals who worked with me had collaborated together it would have saved money, time and it would have saved me some sanity as well. My husband. So what we saw here was really a lack of coordinated care and a lack of professionals working together, which left Carmen searching for answers for her back pain and navigating her own way from professional to professional, as well as across specialists in different roles. First, her doctor sent her away with medication and, and not much else, no answers. The neurologist sent her to physiotherapy, but there was no communication between her physiotherapy and her chiropractor, who were all trying to treat her pain. Without her provider speaking, Carmen was the one who had to communicate her health status, her diagnosis, and her condition to each doctor, as well as the physiotherapist, as well as potentially other providers that she was working with. Um, Julie Drury is a Canadian leader in patient partnerships, calls this being the courier of information, how people are often the ones who have to navigate and also share their information from provider to provider, bringing most important health details from person to person. The impact here was that Carmen couldn't get relief for pain or answers as to why it was happening and who knows what would have happened and what would have changed for her had they had a conversation together. So what is interprofessional collaboration? What exactly does that mean? So we'll, we'll take a moment to define that. From the World Health Organization, it's the difference between inter sorry, it's uh, multiple health workers from different backgrounds providing comprehensive health services by working with clients, their families, carers, and communities to deliver the highest quality of care across settings. So it is a different between interprofessional and interdisciplinary. Uh, interdisciplinary could mean medical specialty or focus differs, but not necessarily different roles. So you could have a doctor, a family doctor, and a neurologist, and they may be interdisciplinary, but not interprofessional. The other thing that's really important in addition in addition to the fact that it involves other roles is that it involves working with clients or with patients and their families. So when we think about health literacy, there are a lot of common elements with interprofessional collaboration. For example, it's really looking at the quality of care across settings related to system navigation needs that we know about for health literacy. The understanding of different roles and how different professions can provide support and help is something that the team members need to understand to collaborate effectively, and as well is something that often is a health literacy challenge if people don't know who their team members are or what their roles are and how they can help. Um, that's something that often in a rehab hospital, we would see people weren't necessarily sure of how different individuals contributed to their care. Uh, this can also influence access. If physiotherapy isn't suggested by a doctor, for example, people may not be familiar with how physio can help, how to access that, how to get referred for physio, or even how to pay for physio. So, Interprofessional collaboration, like the field of health literacy, is its own field because of the recognition that we need to work in teams to really maximize output outcomes. Sometimes we'll talk about how to do this because as great as it sounds, it doesn't just happen on its own. And like health literacy, it needs an intentional focus and set of practices to help it along. Um, also, like health literacy, effective interprofessional collaboration is linked to a number of really positive outcomes, including improvements in patient safety and case management, and really the optimal use of the skills of each healthcare team member, which leads to all of these benefits. So like the work that we do in health literacy, interprofessional collaboration leads to better care that is more engaging to the patient and family. What's the difference between multi-professional or interprofessional? That's another thing that's important to talk about. Multi-professional care is when we work with other healthcare professionals, but we don't necessarily focus on shared goals, patient care planning, or collaboration. So even teams that are working together in the same location, so a, a, a team that involves different professionals on the same unit, for example, may not have the time or tools to collaborate together. 
Interprofessional collaboration is more than working on teams with other healthcare professionals. It means working together on shared goals that are most important to the patient. So for example, with Carmen, at first we saw a little collaboration or even multi-professional care. So she was sent away by, with no diagnosis or treatment plan by her doctor. So she navigated on her own to another provider. So I, can, I can't help but wonder when I see this, if Carmen spoke with her doctor about the decision to see a chiropractor or just went because she needed relief and didn't know where else to go. When the chiropractor didn't help, she sought another doctor who worked with another professional, a physiotherapist, but still there was no coordination and Carmen's relief was limited to being at when she was at the chiropractor. When you have to wonder with little more, little more coordination, they might have been able to find, help find that relief last longer or help Carmen understand what was happening and how she could treat the pain herself. Siloed care, much like inconsistent information, ultimately led to little or no relief for Carmen's back pain. Now, on the other hand, what could interprofessional care have looked like for Carmen? Perhaps she would have been referred to a physiotherapist in the first place with more than just medication and basic information. If there had been a discussion between her physiotherapist and chiropractor, they could have helped paint a clearer picture for her of what was going on, what exercises she could have done at home to help that relief last longer, ways to manage the pain, and ultimately to feel better. So when you look at these two pictures here, it looks messier with the interprofessional approach. The multi-professional approach is, is just neater looking. So what is the secret sauce and how do we take all this and make it happen? And so for that, Jill is going to tell you all about effective interprofessional collaboration. Thanks, Farah. So hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for uh, participating so far. Um, yeah, what is the secret sauce? If I was to ask you this question and you were in the room with me right, right now, I would hope to, um, that you would say that working interprofessionally comes um, with communication between professions, trust um, between professions, getting to know one another, and uh, understanding each other's roles and, and responsibilities. Um, it does take an in, intentional focus to collaborate interprofessionally, and there have been competencies developed for this. Uh, so if you mind the next slide. Um, in the United States, these core competencies are outlined by the Washington DC Interprofessional Education Collaborative, and they show that within the community, community and the population, we have patient and the family, and to have effective collaboration, we need to have interprofessional teamwork, communication, shared values, and an understanding of the roles and responsibilities of the team members. So we're not gonna go too deep into this tool, but it's nice to know that there are tools out there um, to help you take an intentional focus and plan your team effectively. Um, and we also want to enable patient needs and experiences. So when interprofessional collaboration goes well, patients notice this and they express their satisfaction with the process. So we're gonna watch another little clip here where it goes well. Um, my son has had a lot of experience working with multiple healthcare providers. He was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder when he was just past two years old. And after that, shortly after that, we started receiving 20 hours a week of early intervention services in our house. At the time, uh, we lived in a small town and many of these services took place in the morning in our house and what would happen is there would be a service provider in there working with them, usually starting around 8 o'clock. And as he or she were finishing up, the next one would be in there waiting to to work with Calvin and they would see what the first person was doing and they'd say, hey, you know, what have we been working on with Calvin? Oh, that sounds great. You know what? I can pull some of that into what I had planned for today. And the whole process just ended up being really, really nice and seamless. And you know, it was probably one of two of the best years that we could have asked for for him at that point. As we moved into the school years, um, it, it changes slightly in that the services um, from all of the providers take place in school. And so it's sort of a leap of a faith for a parent that you have to assume that these services are indeed taking place. And But what happens is you become more responsible and you become a little bit more aware and you start asking more questions. Um, what I have found, we've had wonderful experiences at school, 
But what I've found is that what makes a very big difference is when the top people, the administrators, the principals, the assistant principals, everybody is aware of the roles of the team. Everyone knows what a speech language pathologist does. Everybody knows what an occupational therapist does. And they all know what they're working on with Calvin because that makes it sort of a team effort. Oh, that's wonderful. And as she mentioned, when the professionals talk to one another, it was some of the best years of care that Calvin received. So, and then when the entire team understands each other's roles and responsibilities, it provides for seamless care. And she was obviously very satisfied with that care. So um, at the University Health Network in Toronto, we have a clinical interprofessional education and care team. We're based in the clinical education department and we work closely with the Center for IPE, um, Interprofessional Education at the University of Toronto. So what we do is provide consultations to the staff and over the years we were noticing um, staff were requesting more information on how to make their projects, their work, their care more interprofessional, not just multi professional. They had heard the evidence and they knew that working interprofessionally was ideal and they were just unsure how to put it into, a practic into practice. Um, so in response to these needs, we were working with the Center for Interprofessional Education and we developed a tool called the Interprofessional Lens. So next slide, please. The interprofessional lens is a practical tool that with questions you can ask yourself um, to clarify if interprofessional needs are being addressed. You can apply this lens to many areas. Um, for example, it can be applied to care activities such as discharge planning or wound care, swallowing procedures, transferring patients. Um, it's also very useful in meetings, uh, general team meetings, small huddles, town halls even. Um, it's been used for creating projects such as new patient education material, posters, signage, even continuing education workshops such as this. Um, for our in-person version of this workshop, we're able to have interactivity between the participants and allow others to learn about with and from each other. And um, we also have a version of this workshop for students and we use this, we use the lens to help ensure equitable um, it was equal across all professions for the student population. So as you're out there, I'd like you to think of uh, initiatives that you are leading and how within any of these contexts or situations, we can ask very important questions that can make the situation more interprofessional, more equitable, more diverse. So the questions begin with why. Um, why is an interprofessional approach important to this work and why is this work important to each member of the team? Um, for example, in your first meeting, is there a discussion about why this work is important to everyone? Allowing everyone to express their goals puts everyone on the same page for moving forward and tapping into their motivations will, and their goals will help um, with the uptake of the project and promote its sustainability. So the next question is a question of what, so what is the goal of the work and how will working interprofessionally enable this goal? Um, will working collaboratively help you identify a shared priority? The next question is who, this is a, a very important one, who is involved? So um, are there two or more different professionals, professionals or roles involved? How can more professions get involved? Also important to think about who's not at the table and should they be there. Uh, one example from my experience on a conference planning committee, uh, we were putting together a healthcare education conference and looking at the roles of the members of the committee, we were prompted to think about who else could be on this committee. Um, we wanted this healthcare conference to be relative relevant to the clinicians at UHN. So we made sure to include a clinician on the committee. Um, we were, all, were also a large teaching hospital, so we wanted to make sure to include um, a current student and staff from student services on this committee to ensure everyone had a voice on what would be useful to them. Um, another very important question is to ask is how to include the patients and their families in this discussion. And also, are we including diverse voices in the project or the conversation? So the next we want to consider where. Where is this activity occurring? How might the space and location impact some of the participants differently? Is everyone able to access the location? 
um, it's important to ask, like, are meetings held in an area where other professionals are not able to access? Uh, for example, I used to work in a lab. Um, we, were we were in an area that was restricted due to biohazardous materials. It was a locked area. Um, and our meeting rooms were in this, in this locked area, which made it difficult to collaborate with others. Um, doctors, nurses did not have access, let alone patients or their families. So that, that reduced our, our ability to collaborate with others. It's a, um, another part of the where is our meetings held in an office uh, to, where one profession sits behind a desk. Um, I think this would reinforce a hierarchy that may prevent complete collaboration. It, May, you may want to have your, your meetings around a, a small table so everyone feels equal and able to contribute and reduce any implicit hierarchies. Also, whenever we set up a workshop or conference, we were always uh, trying to assign seating to mix different professions together to allow people to interact with each other and learn about each other. So um, it's also very important to address that question. The lens also addresses the question of when, uh, to think about the, when the activity is scheduled. For example, are meetings held during the day when nurses on night shift aren't able to attend? Um, are you making it easy for patients to participate? We recently had a workshop series where with an interprofessional group of students and a patient partner was facilitating. Um, this patient partner traveled from a city about two hours away to be a part of these meetings. So we made sure to have the meetings like during the day when she could access, come to the site and where she was able to have a lot of advance notice on the meeting dates and times. And obviously these days it would be much easier if to include as many people as you can by virtually and have them uh, in a virtual meeting. It's just uh, whatever makes it easier to have them included and have their voices heard. So this when question also includes when um, have you included time and space for discussion and interactivity. So these are key elements to promote interprofessional collaboration and it's important to set aside time to allow for participants to learn about one another. So the last question on the lens is how, and there's a couple areas to this um, question. How will the group, group process be attended to? How will um, group norms be established? Will someone be assigned to facilitate? Facilitation can help clarify the jargon between professions. And as Farah discussed earlier at the beginning of this webinar, confusion arises when abbreviations are used and a facilitator can really help with help with that. So facilitation can also ensure everyone has an equal opportunity to contribute and address any conflicts that arise. So now with all these questions buzzing in your head, we're going to apply the lens to a situation. Um, first, you should have access to the lens under the session details, and it is a double-sided document. Um, from this link at the top here in the slideshow, you will be able to access um, the full document with other scenarios and further tips on how to use the lens. So as you can see, it's a very detailed document. It will take a lot of time and planning to consider these questions, um, but it is that going through these questions that will really help us work toward situations, activities, materials, making everything more equitable across professions and roles. So the Lens will be, yep, that's okay. Thanks, Sarah. You can go on. Um, we will apply it to a scenario. So we had this experience with a team who is developing a weekend pass tool to support patients leaving the rehab hospital to spend time with family. So to apply this situation, we will apply the lens to make it more successful. Uh, the first question that we have is why. Um, so this this uh, scenario involved a group of interprofessional inter students from a stroke unit, and they came together for a series of seminars and group work to learn from, with, and about each other. And through their collaborative discussions, they identified there was a need for a weekend pass tool for the rehab patients. So this is basically a document that outlined all of the information the patient would need for a weekend visit to their home. Um, and all professions express the need for this tool. So the what, uh, while designing this pass, uh, the students specifically identified the goals for each professional. 
For example, the occupational therapist indicated the activities they would like to see on the pass, and the pharmacist explained what drug information would be their priority. Um, the social worker, nurse, doctor, physical therapist all contributed with their goals. So it was really well-rounded um, and everyone had a chance to contribute. So the um, who question was interprofessional students, the clinicians on the unit, and then a patient partner was also included to explain his needs for the weekend pass. Um, he identified areas that were very different than the clinicians because the clinicians were very concerned about the safety of the patient, which is understandable. However, the patient was more concerned about relationships and how he was going to spend time with his family and what normal looked like for the, week, for the weekend, um, what intimacy may look like, how he was going to talk with his family. So um, it was important to include his voice so that his views were on the pass as well and this gave a better perspective for the pass. So the meetings were held in a neutral meeting room on the unit and the patient partner was able to attend these meetings as well. And they were held over lunch hour to avoid patient treatment times and on specific days where the whole team would be on site. Um, we have students who aren't there certain days of the week. We made sure to have these meetings on the days that everyone was on site. The how, um, the group process was facilitated by two clinical staff and they were from different professions offering different points of view. They co-facilitated co these uh, seminars. Uh, they also coordinated the patient involvement, which was helpful. The group established group norms with the facilitators to guide how the team was going to work together and avoid any hierarchies and promote a safe learning environment. So the end result was the weekend pass was very well received by the clinical staff when it was presented and it is still being used by patients three years later. And in conclusion of this scenario, it was very effective to apply the lens to this team's work. And it was great the lens can address these areas, these questions. Um, and the great thing about the lens is we can turn it into a checklist to help you work through the questions. And I would encourage you to use it in a, any way that feels right to you. And it's very applicable to different areas of diversity and literacy. Um, and patient education. So that's the conclusion of my scenario. <laughs> and uh, so, and now I'll take over for Jill to bring it back to the current situation and, and COVID. So there's so many ways that we could um, look at COVID-19. And, and I think what's really emerged is that um, any challenges that were around before seem to be more challenging and, and harder in COVID, at least initially. And so interprofessional collaboration is even more important at this time. And, uh, and we need this approach more than ever. Fast changing information, we have care that can, at least speaking from a hospital context, care that can impact units across the hospital and out in the community with information that literally is changing by the minute. Examples of successful inter -collaboration, interprofessional collaboration during COVID time um, there are actually so many and having a culture and attitude of interprofessional collaboration going into COVID was really helpful for getting these things off the ground quickly and started. So two examples uh, to give you. One is just an overall um, place and room for interprofessional collaboration, which was a group that was called COVID Operations and was responsible for implementing COVID care across all of the hospitals that are part of the University Health Network, taking direction from a, a higher level steering committee and really focusing on how to implement COVID on the ground. So what this group did was it brought people together from across the hospital to plan various changes or needs and that, that might be influencing care uh, and staff and staff safety as well. So for example, a protected code blue for initially suspected COVID and then all patients in the hospital looking at PPE and lots of other needs. So during the time that this group was active, um, there would be meetings weekly with opportunities for people to speak up and, and talk about what was happening on their units and troubleshoot in the moment. So for example, there would be when, when there was a huge focus on uh, personal protective equipment stock and what that looked like at different times, there would be people coming and talking about the stock at the hospital and then having individuals from the units talk about how they were actually accessing it and what it looked like and different things that were happening that maybe looked a little different than they were intended to or the policy outlined. So 
that people could actually work through in the moment what that looked like. Um, and so when, uh, when the uh, initial COVID, when the need for this group to meet ended and, and things were considered more stable, one of the comments in the, in the debrief after that many members around the table commented on was that having everyone together at the table from all the different units of the hospital and not just the clinical care units, but all the background units, patient experience and engagement, how helpful that was to really understand in the moment what was happening with COVID and how it made a real difference for our, our ability to actually respond to things in the moment. Um, and then another example or a case study that I'm going to walk you through more specifically is around developing information on COVID assessment eligibility. So um, in the early COVID days, testing wasn't widely available in the province and people were coming to the emergency department for tests but might not be eligible for it. Uh, our hospital also opened up an assessment center so that people where people were being tested for COVID regularly but there were still very strict criteria around who was eligible. And so we had an emergency room doctor reach out to us for help developing something that could help facilitate the discussion when people were not being tested. So to explain to them why they weren't eligible, but then also to help them understand the complexities around what that meant for their behavior and self-isolation, and that it also didn't mean that they were COVID-free, which was a hard thing for people to really wrap their heads around if they weren't being tested, why that meant that, that they could still have COVID. So why was an interprofessional approach so important in this specific initiative? And why did we need to go out and really talk to lots of different people and instead of just the person who approached us. So we knew that multiple providers could be having this conversation with patients. The doctor was just one person involved. Um, throughout the assessment and self-care process, there were lots of different individuals on the team that could be speaking with a patient and would need to really emphasize and reinforce this information. So nursing, other providers in the emergency department, and from triage all the way through to discharge. And in addition to considering these roles, we also needed to think about where else people may need to use or access this information. So if someone came into the hospital, didn't get an assessment, but then went home, how could they share that information with their family? The, if they went to the emergency department, we didn't want people who were coming into the COVID assessment center to get totally different information if they're run by the same hospital and following the same rules. So we had to be sure that everyone was involved from, from both places and both sides so that the context was right and the information was suitable in all settings. What were the goals of this work and why was an interprofessional approach so important going through the lens? So the goal was consistent, clear information and that would help providers share the same messaging about eligibility for testing, especially in early days when eligibility and testing was changing so much. It was so critical to have all of the information be consistent so that individuals would understand it and, and would buy into it, would, would, you know, there were so many pieces of misinformation out there and we needed to avoid that. So working interprofessionally and across clinics helped ensure that the message was consistent and that it was aligned with the practice that was taking place in multiple settings. It would ultimately make the tool more usable for professionals in both clinics and promote the tool because by engaging people in the development, they would know that it was there. They would remember working on it and that they would be bought into the information in there so that it wasn't the one doctor developing it, using it and everyone else just leaving it on the shelf. So who? Professionals, anyone, we really wanted to ensure that there were touch points with anyone who might be using this information or interacting with patients to understand their experience, including, including patients themselves. So in general, the professions here were nursing and medicine, but we also needed to include infection prevention and, prevention and control practitioners who were leading the hospital's effort but not necessarily involved with the details of the emergency department and the assessment center communications. Patients weren't at the table for this, so we wanted to bring them in. So we brought in patient partners as well to review the information and identify any outstanding questions or needs that may be there after, the, after they had read through the information. Also, we got great insight from them into some of the tone and responses in the brochure to ensure that what we were writing to be clear didn't come across as cold, unfeeling or anything like that. So continuing to go through the lens and thinking about how we considered the interprofessional approach, 
the where and the when was more tricky with, uh, with COVID because a lot of this was virtual. We were no longer able to meet, um, both because of timing differences and uh, because some people were remote and some people were still in the hospital. So it, also different professionals had different hours and timing. So we really had to put an effort forward to make sure that we were getting people at the times and in the ways that they could respond, especially with something that was such a, a high pressure document. So it really required us to understand the needs of each team member and recognize even things like when would we normally hear back on email from this certain team member and what did that mean for our approvals and process. Um, so we really had to get involved with helping to coordinate and make sure that we were leaving space for the people who needed a little bit longer, for the people who had to respond at a different time or maybe needed more help on email. In terms of the how, we also had to focus on addressing the comments that came through from each profession, even though sometimes we saw different practices. So uh, one example was that with eligibility, even when people weren't eligible, the recommendation about going home and being in self-isolation stayed true. And one professional commented that the tone that we took wasn't strong enough about isolation and leaving the hospital, but yet we had to follow the infection prevention and control practices that the Ministry of Health was putting forward. So we really had to work with multiple providers to reach a tone that conveyed the responsible and right health information, but didn't also go past what we could as a hospital advocate for and, uh, and provide in, in practice. So really through using these approaches and considering who was at the the table, why they needed to be there, and help it, how it helped support the goal, we were more successful to create a tool that was useful by people in multiple settings and really ultimately met the patient's needs in a way that could help convey the information so that they could be safe and, and go home understanding more about their COVID risk and, and the need for self-isolation. Um, and all of this was done as quickly as possible given the need to get it out there right away. So the lens was really helpful and, and using these questions and approaches, even under pressure, was really helpful just to make sure that we got it right at the beginning and take that time at the front end so that we didn't have to go back and revise because it wasn't right. We did have to go back and revise because the information changed constantly, but at least we were set and we had our pathways of who needs to approve this now and what does it look like as that information was changing. Um, and the great news is, is that there's no longer shortage of, of assessment uh, tests here. So we did eventually retire the brochure when it was no longer necessary. So with that, we're, um, we're going to end the uh, formal part of the session to leave a few minutes for Q&A and end in about eight minutes. Um, so we have a few questions that have come in. And just before we go over to that, we wanted to note for you one more time that the Interprofessional Lens is available through the Center for Interprofessional Education at the University of Toronto or U of T. If you search in Google for the IPE Lens, you'll find it. Um, so for those of you, we have some questions that have come in now and so if you do have questions please put them in the box and if you also have any thoughts about the questions or the projects that you're sharing or working on that would uh, that would work for this approach we can read those out as well um, so uh, we'll just move over to some of the questions now and um, and Jill and I will co-facilitate them so um, one, we do have a couple questions about access to the PowerPoint, and the answer is that the PowerPoints are all available on the conference website. If you go in where you clicked for the, uh, to join the conference, you'll also see that there is a tab with resources and the PowerPoint is there. Um, in terms of the links to the videos, they don't, I don't believe that they're embedded, so we can share those through IHA or in the comments. We'll make sure to put those on the, on the website. Um, so just going through, um, there's a question about the copyrights for the lens. Uh, Jill, I'll throw that one to you. Um, well, it was developed uh, with University of Toronto uh, Center of Fire IPE, so I would, I would think that the copyright <laughs> belongs to them. Um, it looks like the Center, the Healthcare Advancement IHA would like to answer this question live as well. Okay, I think I think that might have been me answering it. Oh, okay. It. Okay. Um, <laughs> I got um, it. Okay. Sorry, we're, uh, we're, we're not newbies at, but the, but the webinar function is new for us. I, yeah. And I think it's, it's available for use for people to use, but I think any adaptations would need to go through the center. Definitely. Yeah, it's free to use for everyone. 
Um, and hopefully you can use it. Uh, the, the one question here, uh, using the lens in action for an emergency response by COVID, did you receive any pushback or time constraints in engaging interprofessionals and families? Um, things are moving so quickly where I work that this would be hard to facilitate during an emergency. Uh, did you yourself, Farah, because I, I know with us, um, we're constantly revisiting this and uh, thinking about that it, it needs to be woven into the uh, actual work we do. And it's not just something that's on top and extra. This is, this is actually within all the work that we do. Uh, yes, and, and I would say for us, it's, it, it was woven in, but having, we really had to emphasize the importance of having all stakeholders sign off. And it, it was tough at times when we were under really, really tight timelines, and we just had to keep updating people and saying, here's what we're waiting for, um, without pointing the fingers at any specific profession or individuals, but to explain why it was so important to have that, and, you know, really getting that at the front end. So it is it, I, I, one of the pieces of advice is just to really connect with individuals and explain to them why it's so critical. And, and most people do understand the benefit for having it done at, at the highest quality, even if it takes a little bit of extra time. Definitely. Um, okay, so just uh, randomly going through the questions, um, <laughs> starting from... <laughs> there are lots of questions that are coming in um, and we can answer some of them afterwards as well on the site. So for those that we don't get to, um, there was a question I, I would suggest a home health person if involved, which is a, which is absolutely a great suggestion. So it's not only about the professions, it's also about thinking all the different touch points that individuals have. And so if they're going home and they're getting services at home to find ways of engaging those individuals as well is, is very critical and really think about anyone that, that a patient may have a touch point with. Um, COVID-19 aside, does the need for seminars or continuing education regarding interprofessional education, the seamless care, et cetera, indicate a gap in the curriculum topic among various disciplines of care team members? Um, Jill, that seems like a good one to maybe answer and discuss the approach of the Center for IPE. Yeah, definitely. The Center for IPE works uh, toward um, beginning interprofessional collaboration early in a student's um, career when they're beginning their um, their training and to incorporate it into all the work that they do. Um, so there definitely are gaps and um, in interprofessional collaboration and in, in what students are learning. So we also, Center for P IPE provides uh, electives and um, other workshops and opportunities for the students to learn more about uh, interprofessional collaboration. So uh, definitely useful and worth checking out their website if you'd like to learn more or send us a message. Um, as, a, as an IP facilitator going to an event where first year health profession students of, uh, from all over U of T come together and it launches their interprofessional collaborative learning for their entire uh, academic time at U of T. It's really powerful and it really does, uh, it, it shows how important it is to focus on collaboration built into the education. Uh, I think it sets the tone for their education and then as they become clinicians themselves, um, it's already woven into their practice and uh, that just is changing from the ground up, right? Absolutely. Um, another question here, is there a way to accurately address power dynamics when using the interprofessional lens questions? I think the interprofessional lens brings to the forefront some of these power dynamics um, and I think recognizing them and, and calling them out um, is the first step. Uh, I think it's very difficult to, to move forward with that, but it's, as long as we give it a try and a uh, tool like the interprofessional lens is helpful in, in answering some of the, asking some of these questions that may call out these dynamics as well. Thanks, Jill. The give you time to think. <laughs> um, is a great question too, sorry to jump ahead. It's can interprofessional collaboration be incorporated into electronic health records to improve medical and outpatient care? Well, I think that would be fantastic. Um, I'm not an expert in this at all, so I'm not sure um, how, how to go about with the electronic patient records at this time. So sorry, I'll, I'll defer that question for now. 
And I, I can also uh, add to that. It's, it's definitely a, a great thing to have. It can be very challenging because often professions do have their own tools and it requires looking at the different um, regulatory requirements. So we've definitely seen that and at UHN have, have worked with teams who have developed uh, interprofessional tools. One of the key things is also helping people understand if they're not interprofessional, it's how do you use the documentation of other professionals to help your own practice and where can you look for certain things. We had developed a documentation guide for teach back and patient education in patient teaching and discovered or learned through working with the healthcare teams that a lot of people were using the nursing record and even other professions could use it if they were told how they could use it and, and, and really they, they became familiar with it as a, as a source for learning what patients had already, had already learned. And even though because of their own professional requirements, it didn't replace their documentation, it was still a way of helping helping the tool be on the same page. So in the absence of, a, of an interprofessional tool, helping, helping each profession feel comfortable about how they can work together within the documentation can be a really helpful thing as well. Um, we'll take it at 2.50. We want to make sure people have a break for the next session. So what we'll do is answer one more question and then the rest we'll try to address in the, in the chat. And as well, because there are so many people in this room who probably have great experience with interprofessional collaboration as well, we encourage all of you to try to share that as well. We do apologize that this was more us talking and would have loved an, uh, an interactive session where we could learn from everybody. So please jump on in that way. Um, so the last question that we'll answer for today is how did this method address intercultural communication barriers, which is a great question too. Oh, Jill, do you want to? Oh, go ahead. Or do you go want ahead. me to? Sure. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I guess I would start by saying that um, a lot of times we talk about professions have their own culture, and that's a big part of the tool is helping us to ask some of those questions to scratch the surface and, and dig deeper into what each culture means and what some of the actions or behaviors are around, you know, how we can break through those cultures. So, for example, thinking about where we meet in a locked room is a really important cultural component of a profession that, that we may want to consider. So the lens is a really good starting point to ask some of those questions and to intentionally consider different components of who is at the table. Um, and they're just starting to ask some of those questions and then digging a little deeper into other intercultural communication tools, um, such as the Kleiman questions and, and others. Um, Interest, combined with the interprofessional lens can be really, really effective for digging deep and having different ways of asking questions, making sure that from the top that all these different factors are, are considered in different perspectives. Anything, Jill, to jump in with there? Uh, no, sorry, I'm losing you a little bit. <laughs> oh no, okay. So, yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, thank you for answering that. And I want to answer so many more of these questions, <laughs> actually, too. But I think we have to have to go at this time. Yes. Um, yeah. All right. Sounds good. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us. We will jump online and, and work with the IHA to try to get these questions online as well so that we can answer more and, and uh, enjoy the conference, have uh, enjoy all the rest of the sessions. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Yes. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.